Hola mi gente! Hi everybody! Thank you for coming back to my channel. Today's video is going to be about my five picks so far for my girls book club. So I mentioned in another video that I am part of a book club with my best friends. And so I made it a mission of mine to choose books written by Latin American authors only. And I have this rule for a couple of reasons. One is to bring more diversity into the book club because I know that there's just a lot of popular authors out there that are not from the Latin American community. So I just kind of wanted to bring a little part of myself into the, the group. And the other reason is really just catch up. I felt when we started the book club uh, that I, at that point, hadn't read enough books written by Latin American authors. So for myself, alone just as a selfish reason i wanted to just pick those books because i haven't read enough and yeah and so i wanted to talk about the five books that i've picked so far and just kind of tell you a little bit about them why i like them so much um well why i love the ones i love and why i like the ones i like so 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 yeah let's start let's get it started i thought about what would be a good book to start with and I felt like the correct book to start with was the one I chose just because it is it's such a good short novel it's um, it has a lot of meaning to a lot of people and to my huge surprise none of my girlfriends had read it and that book is The Alchemist by Paulo Coelho a little funny story about how I actually started I read this book before back in 2001 or two back in that summer that I started reading everything and it was really right off the high of of Harry Potter <laughs> so I was looking for more books to read uh, that sounded similar to that and my young mind saw The Alchemist <laughs> and Nicholas Flamel was an alchemist and I thought, ooh, this sounds really magical. So it is a magical book, but for different reasons. And it did stay with me after I read it oh so long ago because it was such a good book. So for The Alchemist, the story begins with a, a shepherd boy from Spain and he has this dream that tells him to go to Egypt to find some treasure. And so he goes on this adventure to Egypt and along the way he finds himself, you know, he meets with a lot of different people, including an alchemist, and they're all kind of pointing him in the direction that he needs to go. As he travels through Egypt, you know, he finds himself with a lot of obstacles that are stand, that stand in his way. He needs to kind of have like side adventures sort of before he can move on to the next level I guess but every step of the way gets him a little closer to his treasure and the best way to really put this book in a nutshell and to ultimately simplify it is a self-help self-empowerment book but in a novel format so this book plays around with the theme of a personal legend which basically means that you're at a point in your life where everything is clear everything is possible like you know what you need to do with your life and i'm pretty sure a lot of us struggle with that idea like what what should i do with my life like ah we only have one life live it to the fullest but what do i do with it so that's really what like they touch on that theme like personal legend you really want to find out what your your personal legend is going to be so yes yeah, so i really like that about the book especially because it, it does kind of Every time I've read it, I've only read it twice, but every time I've read it, I do kind of start thinking about what my personal legend would be. And it's, you know, it's it's still unclear sometimes. It's clear and then it's unclear. There's, there's always like challenges, but I guess that's really the part of the journey that we call life, right? And then the book also touches on destiny or maktu, which means it is written. If it's for you, it's there for you. But at the same time, it is our duty to make sure we find that personal legend. It's not just gonna be handed to us. And so that's just, that's another thing that, that we see in the book. Now, I'm not telling you any part of the, the adventure, but that's because it's an adventure. It's it's really fun adventure. It's, the themes of the book is really what what really makes it shine and it's a very popular book so like for example on the back of this book this is uh this is like the 25th anniversary uh edition so on the back of this book it says to realize to realize one's destiny is a person's only obligation maktu <laughs> 
so yeah it's a wonderful book i i think it's i think everyone should at least read it once it's really short and the story is great in itself and it just has a really good message and it, i'm gonna i i almost guarantee you that when you finish reading it you're gonna feel good you're gonna feel good you're gonna feel empowered so this is a total five star book for me and you should definitely definitely check it out the next book that i chose for um my second round of book club is a book that i've been wanting to read for a very long time and i kind of jumped on the opportunity as soon as i was able to pick my next book and that book is Cien Años de Soledad by Gabriel Garcia Marquez. If this isn't the first book I've read by Ga uh, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, but um, it's the first novel I've read. So back in high school, my English teacher gifted me a book of short stories, which I still have on my shelf. Somewhere, right here. Just so I still have it on my shelf. The first time I read the short stories, it was the first time I've read that kind of writing with the magical realism and just like the way he even as it is translated it just seems super elegant so I've always intended on reading one of his novels I just kind of kept pushing it pushing it pushing it and finally I was like you know what I'm picking it I don't care we're all gonna read it but I said to myself that I wanted to read it in Spanish because that's the original language it was written in a uh, guy um, Gabriel Garcia Marquez is a Colombian writer and I really wanted to read it or at least try to read it in Spanish. So what I ended up doing was getting the book in Spanish, but I also got it on audiobook in Spanish. So for a while, for the first half of the book, I actually just, I listened to it and read it. <laughs> so so I, was re I read it while I was listening to someone read it. So it was just a lot easier. But for the second half, I, I mostly listened to it just because I got busy at work and I, I was traveling a lot so I just ended up listening to the rest but it was still a great experience so this novel tells the multi-generational story of the Buendia family and it starts with Jose Arcadio Buendia with his wife Ursula and then it follows seven generations after that <laughs> this book is insane with that so the book starts out with Jose Arcadio Buendia he has this vision I don't remember if it was a vision or a dream I think it was a dream about like a glass city or a mirror city um called Macando and so he up he takes his family and he travels out to find a place to where he founded Macando this might not be accurate but he basically found the city where he like his whole generational like the rest of the generation lives let me start off by saying this book is pretty dense it's pretty dense and, it's, and i'm not even talking about like the length length is fine it's about 500 pages long it's very good good story what i mean is there's a lot going on <laughs> The book itself is pretty linear. That like you start with, you start out with the first generation that is referred to, and then move along through the seventh generation all the way to the end. But time lapses and it does kind of go um, sideways sometimes. It's there have there, there's flashbacks, so it's pretty subjective. Respectively, this this book is kind of like everywhere. It's just it's all over the place. Like first of all, there is a tremendous cast of characters, and they all share the freaking same goddamn name. <laughs> Like, how many Arcadios are in this book? Like, ask me. Ask me how many fucking Arcadios. So I'm not gonna lie, that made it a little difficult to follow along. It wasn't that difficult. They're, you know, they, like, they all had their own story, but it was just really hilarious to me. <laughs> a couple of things that piqued my interest in the book is just isolation. Like, it's called Cien Años de Soledad, like, solitude. So, like, I, so solitude in itself is a theme, but I think it's really touching on, like, the egoism of the family because, like, first of all, Jose Arcadio Buendia founded the town, so he himself is also, it's also a very isolated character because he's very intrigued with, like, the supernatural in a way. He gets really interested in, like, these magical aspects of, like, mirrors and ice, and he just gets obsessed with ice, and so he himself is pretty isolated from the rest of the family. And then comes the kids and grandkids and great-grandkids, and they all have, like, their own egoism as well, so they're kind of isolated from the community, which brings me to the next theme that I really like. Again, it's destiny, but this time it's a bit different from like the alchemist destiny where like Maktoub is like, 
you know, it's written and you, it's your job to go and find that destiny. But in here, you have limited control of your destiny because it's shaped by like heredity and environment. So kind of like the nature versus nurture kind of thing. So you have these family members that kind of keep popping up. <laughs> and like a lot of the choices in the universe have already been decided for them because one, they were born out of this family too they're living in a specific location so that in itself means they're destined for something specific as opposed to like how different it was in the alchemist which i like that like the family itself like have really big expectations for themselves like think about uh, jose arcadi one dia he founded this town and it was a big deal but as the generations come along, and again, it's the idea of destiny, you don't have control over it. A lot of misfortune comes upon the family over time. There's like, like deaths, like love lost, like there's war. There's just like this theme of lost dreams and like the hopes and aspirations are thwarted by life. <laughs> How morbid! <laughs> and of course, I cannot forget the magical realism in the book. Gabriel Garcia Marquez is basically one of the founders of the magical realism genre. He, along with Jorge Luis Borges and other writers, really came up with the genre. And if you're not familiar with magical realism, it's basically, to, to put it really simply, unusual circumstances for the reader happening in everyday normal life for the characters but the character sees it as normal so that's really the, the, the most simplest way that i can put it and specifically in this book like the way he uses it is is really funny like a lot a lot of it is just exaggeration of things so i'll give you an example a rain that continued for nearly five years or this is actually really hilarious like let's talk about arcadio who is jose arcadio buendia's second son he gets 17 sons with 17 different women <laughs> all fucking named Arcadio. <laughs> it's just fucking hilarious that is hilarious but to be honest it's just such a great book i really loved it like i love the entire experience of reading this book i think the last thing that i i wanted to say about this book is just that it made me feel nostalgic for like that kind of era in a way it's super weird it's very it's very romanticized for me it's an experience that i would never experience unless i read about it so that's probably what i really like the most about this book so if you haven't read it do yourself a favor and read it it is a magnificent fabulous book okay so now on to the third book this book i was pretty excited about because if you follow my youtube channel you'll see a couple of books i will categorize as books I should have read in high school <laughs> because they were books that either were assigned or were like required reading lists or suggested reading lists uh, books and they're just they're basically classics and this one in particular was actually assigned to me for my AP Spanish class and I didn't read it because it was given to me in Spanish and it was just I didn't have time as a student come on you have time this is the Mexican author and I was super excited to read it that would be like water for chocolate by Laura Esquivez so this book is very yummy pun intended and I really enjoyed this book we follow Tita who is the main protagonist and she grows up to be a masterful chef I love the introduction because she's introduced as a baby who while she was still in the womb would cry so hard that they can hear her outside the womb and when her mom was chopping onions one day in the kitchen she cried so hard because onions make her cry and that she made her mom go into early delivery and she was born right in right on the kitchen table amongst all of the the noodle soup ingredients and that little bit was what made her like a masterful chef. <laughs> so I love that introduction to Tita. So being that she's a masterful chef, this book is very food centric and it's a huge theme in the book. There's 12 chapters in the book and they're all broken up into like a month of the year. Even though the events of the book takes place over longer than a year, they're named January, February, etc. And every month there is a recipe that 
is specializes in and then it talks about that in the chapter or it's somehow involved in the chapter which I love it's like such a great concept that I really just like I was all over it. But of course, Sita isn't just ordinarily talented in the kitchen. There's definitely some magical aspects to her cooking as we see what happens when she cooks. Things happen in the story, which just makes me so happy. So Tita is the youngest of three daughters. And apparently in Mexico, there's this tradition that the youngest daughter is not allowed to get married because she has to take care of her mother which let me get like that just like what why that just sounds so ridiculous to me <laughs> why can't she do both i totally agree with the whole taking care of your mother that is fine but why can't she get married it's so stupid <laughs> so of course tita has a boo and he comes and asks for her hand and what does mama elena do mama elena's her mother he he comes and asks for her hand and she straight up said no you can't marry my youngest daughter however if you want to get married you can have the middle child instead and he accepts promising his dad and himself that even though he's marrying tita's older sister he will only have his heart for tita and he's marrying the sister just to stay close to tita and that's where the story starts <laughs> <laughs> All of that happens in like the first chapter. <laughs> so as you can probably already tell, this book is drama and I am here for it because it's like a novella. <laughs> so as I mentioned earlier, food is a huge theme in this book, which I think is great. It's just a cool concept having food as a theme. I've never really heard of it before. Like I've never read any other book like that before with food as a major theme. And in this book, it's used as a way of communication because Tita communicates her feelings through the food that she makes. So she communicates like love and passion when she makes food for Pedro, which is her boo. She communicates like sadness and hatred to like her sister and her mother. <laughs> so I, I love that concept. Another thing that I really like that, uh, again, I've mentioned with uh, Cienang at the Soda that, and then earlier uh, in another video when I talked about the House of Spirits, is that the idea of family and tradition and generations uh, across the story. I live for that. I live for stories about generations. I don't know why. This is like the food concept. You like all these recipes are passed down through generations. So I like that's a really nice theme for me. And then of course, love. How can we not talk about love for this book? Tita is basically the vessel of love. Love for her family, love for her passion of cooking, and of course like romantic love for Pedro. Oh, Pedro. Yeah, and she's basically like the spark, the literal and figurative spark that like makes this book fire. Like this book is fire and you're gonna get that reference if you read the book. So definitely read it. It's a five star for me. I love it. I love this book. Such a good book. The next book that I chose for my round of book club is actually not the book that I originally thought about picking. I thought about picking The House of Spirits uh, as I talked about in another, in another video, but I didn't. And I'm a little sad about it, but it's okay because I picked this book for a couple different reasons, which I'm not gonna go into because it'll take too long. But one of the reasons is my cousin was also reading it and I asked her if she liked it. She said it was really good. And I figured, hey, if she reads it too, I can just invite her to book club. That book was The Brief and Wondrous Life of Oscar Wow by Juno Diaz. So this story is about a guy named Oscar de Leon and he's this overweight Dominican guy who's just basically trying to find himself and he wants to find love. So this story follows not only Oscar, but it follows his sister Lola, his mom Belly, his grandfather, basically generations, and the family curse that has cursed their lives <laughs> throughout all these generations, which they call El Fuku. So it takes us, you know, from the United States, New Jersey, to Dominican Republic and back again. And it's, it's just a very clever story. There are so many aspects of this book that I really like. There's also some aspects that kind of annoy me, which is why I rated it a four instead of a five. Also, I read this book before all the allegations about Juno Diaz came about, so probably won't get into that 
just because like again, I read it before everything happened so I'm, I'm just gonna talk about how I felt about the book at the time I'll start by going into like the stuff that I did like about the book so one thing I liked about it was the theme of identity and as a member of the Latino community I can totally understand where like the whole machismo ideal for men, for Latino men, come from and the, the pressure. So at the beginning of the book, Oscar is described as like, according to the narrator, as like a little Casanova because he's very suave, he liked to dance with girls, he wasn't afraid to approach girls, and we see that he ends up with like two girlfriends at the same time at one point. But something happens where he decides to dump one of the girls to be with the other girl and then this girl dumps him like two days later and according to the narrator this is when like his life just starts to spiral and everything goes down the drain so as he's moving along through life like he graduates from high school goes to Rutgers New Brunswick and he's trying to find himself in that community he just kind of delves into his like fantasy world and role-playing games and is kind of like a social mutant in a way as my husband would put it <laughs> but he uses this like he uses fantasy he uses comic books and all this nerdy stuff as like a form of escapism because he clearly still doesn't fit into like his dominican roots and his com dominican community so this theme isn't just reserved for oscar because like to be honest oscar is like maybe one quarter of this book it's not really about all about oscar but it's really more about the entire family we see it in like Lola's story and Belly's story and the grandfather's story and like they're all trying to just figure out like what decisions they want to make, what kind of people they want to be and yeah and like that's really great. And then another theme that I wanted to touch on is the theme of colorism and colonialism because it is touched especially because he goes into the, the a brief history of like the Dominican Republic but a lot of it is like a footnotes and then just like the backstory going back in the generations like when he tells Belly's story and the grandfather's story you kind of get this idea of what the Dominican Republic was like in regards to like racism within their own community their own their own people and Oscar is described as black he's really dark skinned Dominican and so it's mentioned in the book that he just doesn't fit in like he's he's too black to fit in with like the white people at Rutgers but then he's too white <laughs> And, and too white in regards to like his nerdiness um, because he likes fantasy and all that stuff too white to be accepted the Latino community I really related to that aspect of the book because I remember being Latina and considered too white to really fit into the Latino community because I was also a nerd and I like to read <laughs> So I guess that made me different, but I did like that he touched on it because colorism is just everywhere. I mean, it's in the black community, it's in the Latin community, it's in the Asian community. It's just, it's, it's all over the place. So I like that he did touch on it because it's a real thing and it's a real problem. The last thing I really liked uh, about the book is just the fuku, the, the curse on the family. I really liked it because la us Latinos, we are superstitious, like, no joke so when he mentions that there's a curse in the family i'm like yeah that makes sense yeah that makes sense it's absolutely possible that there's a curse in the family <laughs> so i like that and and also because this curse is explained via like historical content in in a way because he does go back all the way to when it fell upon the family with his grandfather so that was just really cool to see how the fuku has affected his grandfather, his mother, and like trickle down to his sister and himself. So now I want to talk about the part that I didn't really like. And even though I don't think this is a spoiler, I'm going to just say spoiler alert just in case. If you want to move on to the next book, I'll put a timestamp in the description. Though I don't think that what I'm about to say is a spoiler, but just in case. So the part I didn't like about the book, ironically, is actually the narrator. The narrator turns out to be Junior, who is Oscar's college roommate, and he's also Lola's boyfriend for a good portion of the book. So everything about him just frustrates me. So in turn, his narrative, just the whole narrative frustrated me. So already, he's just a character that I'm like, I would not hang out with you. But... When it comes to Junior, this is exactly what he wants us to think because he's a goddamn phony. His whole narrative is phony as fuck. First of all, within the book standards, 
Junior is your typical Dominican. I want to stress book standards, outline for the book, not me. I want to make that clear. So, Junior is your typical Dominican, objectifies women, sleeps with a bunch of girls, kind of a douchebag. This is what your typical Dominican would be. Very machista, very like, oh, I am just like all that and then some. And this is what he's trying to help out Oscar with. Oscar is like completely opposite, not your typical Dominican. He is a nerd. He is overweight. He is not good with the ladies. And so Junior is tasked to help him out of that shell and just kind of break the mold or break the mold that he's created for himself. So he's always putting him down about his nerdiness and says, like, Oscar, why don't you try to hide it? He wants Oscar to hide his nerdiness, but instead, Oscar wears it like a badge, proud and nerdy. But Junior is not what you think because he's a nerd too and he hides it. And he even says it at like the very beginning when he's talking to us that he tells Oscar to hide it like he does. So we already know that he's kind of a nerd, but he's a fake nerd. But then he turns around and the entire book he's narrating, he throws in a cheap reference like Lord of the Rings or a Lovecraft reference, a Marvel reference. And it just so frustrated me because like he has created this persona for himself that he plays off throughout the entire story and then continues on doing so as the narrator for Oscar's story. And so that, while I was reading it, kind of offended me. I'm like, what the fuck? I don't want to read your like fake assness. Like, why don't you be real? <laughs> I was just so mad that Junior wasn't being real. And the funny thing is, that's pretty genius writing if you really think about it. Like your narrator it has this complexity that is just so deep, but it still annoyed the hell out of me. So that's why I kind of gave it a four stars. Like I had it a three before and I'm like thinking about it, I'm like, no, it's really a four because that in itself is pretty complex, especially if Diaz intended on doing that and if he didn't then he just annoyed the hell out of me so overall this book was really good i really enjoyed it so i think it's a solid book you definitely give it a try this last book is a bit different from the rest of the books i've picked because when it was my turn again this last this actually this current round we had just read the bells and at that meeting i apparently found out that my friends all like ya it was news to me because i don't like ya or I wasn't, no, I don't really consider YA my fancy because I consider myself an adult. But apparently it's a thing. Now that I've joined BookTube, I see that a lot of people my age still really like YA. And I just didn't really think that that was a thing. So when my friends reveal that they really like YA, I'm just like, okay, well, let me see if I can find a YA book that they might like that still has a Latin American author. And this is where this book comes in. So the book that I found is The Weight of Feathers by Anne Marie McClare. This book is about two feuding families, the Palomas and the Corbeos, and they're both traveling performing families. So the Palomas perform as mermaids and they do this beautiful show uh, with really like pretty scales and it's all underwater. It's super cool how they described it. And then the Corbeos are like tight ropes, acrobats with wings and they fly across the trees and it's all very beautiful. I think like the imagery itself was just really nice. Like I was totally down for, for what it was about. And so now we meet the protagonist, uh, the two protagonists, Lace Paloma and Clough Corbeos and their story really intertwines when an explosion at the plant in the area that they're both performing in blows up and basically it just rains acid and chemicals causing Cluck to save Lace because she was trapped in that rain too. So that's where really our story begins. So the first half of the book was really good. I really liked the concept of like the two performing families. I never read a book like that. And I really liked the, the touch of like the magical realism that she tried to put in the book. It, I think it, it worked out pretty well. Both families had like special features that kind of 
implied that they had this ability to perform these things so for example the palomas they all had escalas which were i guess like a form of scales i think that's that's it scales they had like scales which i kind of imagined as like mother of pearl looking kind of scales and they had them like on different parts of their body so it was kind of like a birthmark in a way to be able to perform as a mermaid and the corbeos on the other hand because they're like flying and they have wings they have like natural wings in a way that come out of the back of their heads so that's that so i thought that brought a little bit of that magical realism to the story very cool how she implemented it oh, the story itself was beautifully written um, like one of my friends said, it was it was very flowery writing, which I very much liked. I did feel, however, that she could have just toned it down just a smidge, just a smidge, and it's it, it's like a very, very light critique because the writing was so flowery. It made the book more magical. It was a good aspect of the book. I just thought, in my opinion, it could have just been toned out a very smidge, just just, just tiny. And I think it's because well, once I got to the halfway through the book, I feel like there was a certain expectation and I don't think it fulfilled it. Not that it was a bad thing completely, but for me personally, I think I just had higher expectations for the book. So I gave it a three. Now, keeping in mind that I'm not a big YA person. And so I did want to just make that disclaimer that because this isn't really intended for maybe like my age group maybe that's why i was so harsh on it instead of seeing it as a ya book i saw it as a regular adult book and that's probably why i was a little disheartened however the story is still very beautiful out of the books that Anne marie mclemore has out right now this one is the highest rated book so it ha it's definitely good people really do like it but for me i think it just fell a little flat my friends did like it though, so that made me happy, but yeah. So when I was preparing for book club, I made a list of a bunch of books that I really wanted to read, and I noticed that when I deviated from that list, the, mainly the, the last two books I mentioned, I didn't love them as I did my, I originally had on my list. If I would have stuck with, instead of Oscar Wow, I would have picked The House of Spirits like I had originally planned, I would have also read another five star book. I think the reason for that is because I'm looking for a specific feel, something that the, the first three books I mentioned kind of gave me is this kind of nostalgic feel. And I think that's really what I was looking for. Like, so I think I'm definitely gonna stick to the list that I originally have for the next round and we'll see what happens then. So let me know if you've read any of the books I talked about today. Let me know if you have any specific recommendations of classical Latin American books that I should really read, or maybe even some YA recommendations. I'm only just starting to get into YA again, so if you guys had any good recommendations of YA books written by Latin American authors, please feel free to share in the comments below. But for now, thank you so much for joining me. I will see you in my next video. Adiós.